Shirley Moller, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the high-level dialogue on ASEAN post-pandemic recovery, organized by the ASEAN Secretariat. The dialogue will be held for two hours from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Jakarta time. His Excellency Dato Lim Jokhoi, Secretary General of ASEAN, will deliver the opening remarks. And His Excellency Aladip Rilo, Deputy Secretary General for ASEAN Economic Community, will be the moderator for today. We have four distinguished speakers and three distinguished commentators joining us, which will be later introduced by the moderator. After the speaker's presentation and commentator's feedback, we have 20 minutes of Q&A session. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please be informed of the following. All attendees' microphone and videos are turned off throughout the dialogue. The hand raised feature has also been disabled. Attendees are invited to submit questions for consideration by the panel through the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen. Please use the Q&A box to send in question and not the chat box. Please send us your question well ahead of the Q&A session. The question will be posed by the moderators to the speakers during the Q&A. No replies will be sent in the Q&A box. Lastly, a recording of this event will be available online on the ASEAN Secretariat YouTube channel after the event. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, to formally start the dialogue, we would like to kindly invite Secretary General of ASEAN, His Excellency Dato Lim Jokhoi, to deliver the opening remarks. SG Dato, the floor is yours. Your Excellency, my fellow Deputy Secretary Generals, distinguished speakers and commentators, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to welcome you all to the high-level dialogue on ASEAN post-pandemic recovery organized by the ASEAN Secretariat. In particular, my sincere thanks and appreciation to the speakers and commentators for participating in the dialogue amidst your busy schedule. I'm very pleased to see many good friends supporting us in this important event. I'm also encouraged by the broad representation of our audience, including students. This represents the wide stakeholders affected by the impact of COVID-19 and taking interest in how ASEAN as a region can recover from the pandemic. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 has greatly affected life and livelihood. To date, our region accounts for around 1.5% of global confirmed cases and 1% of global casualty. These figures may seem low, but one life lost is one that too many. The COVID-19 is not just a public health crisis, it is also an unprecedented economic crisis. The movement and travel restriction around, across the world have brought economic and social pulse everywhere to a standstill. Factories face difficulties in getting supplies and workers. Learning is to stop and disrupted and business operation restricted. The global economy is expected to contract by 4.9% this year. Meanwhile, our region will see a 2.7% contraction, the first since the ASEAN, the Asian financial crisis. Given this consideration, we can assure of two things. First, the post-pandemic world will not be a return to business as usual. Our world has been irreversibly transformed by COVID-19 and this call for equal transformative responses. Second, no government, no economy, and no region can combat COVID-19 alone. Rebuilding the world will require all actors to work together for us, to bounce back together and better, stronger towards a more inclusive and sustainable growth. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 has also affected the work of ASEAN. While digital technologies have to an extent 
help us progress our work. They cannot fully substitute the people-to-people -people connection that is at the core of our community. While we may not know when we can successfully overcome COVID-19, what is certain is that we will be able to get through this. It is therefore important for ASEAN not to lose sight from our community building works and regional integration efforts as we take into consideration the experience and lesson learned from COVID-19. Since the early stages of the pandemic, ASEAN continues to be steadfast in helping one another and to work collectively in combating COVID-19. Such commitment proved critical in setting the course for regional action across a range of areas, such as on health, trade, agriculture, tourism, further asserting the relevance of the ASEAN platform. At the recent concluded 36th ASEAN Summit in June, our leader announced a number of key initiatives, including the establishment of COVID-19 ASEAN Response Fund and the commencement of the ASEAN post-pandemic recovery efforts, particularly development of comprehensive recovery framework. The ASEAN Coordinating Council Working Group on Public Health Emergency, a recently established cross-pillar body, has been tasked in coordinating these immediate to long-term policy responses with the support of the ASEAN Secretariat. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me quickly draw your attention to the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework. This framework that we are currently developing will have to be holistic, robust, pragmatic, inclusive, and sustainable. It needs to promote collaborative engagement and contribution for all stakeholders, including the private sector, civil society, and ASEAN external partners. Most importantly, it needs to focus on actionable, impactful measure on strengthening the health or health system, making trade easier, job, restoring jobs, accelerating digitalization and help small businesses and vulnerable sector to survive the pandemic and its aftermath. The private sector has an important role in accelerating post-pandemic economic recovery. To this end, I would like to express my appreciation to the ASEAN Business Advisory Council and the Joint Business Council for their relentless efforts to provide recommendations for the ASEAN recovery. In conclusion, I'm confident that this dialogue will contribute to enriching our understanding on practical ways and means to address various aspects of ASEAN post-pandemic recovery. I wish everyone success in our deliberation. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, SG, for your remarks. And again, uh, good morning to all and welcome to this uh, a high-level dialogue on ASEAN post-pandemic recovery. Uh, my name is uh, Al Rilo. I'm the head of the ASEAN Economic Community Department at the Secretariat, and I will also be the moderator for this event. Uh, today's uh, panel discussion will try to discuss the issue of uh, recovery from this pandemic, particularly from the perspective of ASEAN. Uh, this is, as we all know, a very important issue because, you know, the region right now also tries to uh, recover from this pandemic and also try to address how to contain the spread of the virus. But at the same time, many countries in the region are also trying to explore options on how to reopen the economy uh, and how, for example, also to explore possible recovery path for, for ASEAN. And definitely this is a very challenging task and I'm hoping that our speakers and our discussants will help us go through the, the, the various ideas on how this recovery path for, 
ASEAN will, will, will be realized. Uh, be, maybe before I go through the panel discussion itself, let me uh, try to uh, frame out the issue a little bit. Uh, I think we all realize and we're all aware that ASEAN right now is facing an unprecedented crisis, particularly if you compare that with the previous crisis that the region has faced in 1997 as well as 2008. Uh, during the Asian financial crisis in 1997, output recovery uh, actually was quick. However, it took a while before the recovery reached the pre-crisis level uh, by 1997. Then if you look at the current crisis, I think the recovery here is a bit uh, uncertain and very difficult to predict, primarily because we don't know how this pandemic is going to play out. And also, we don't know how this pandemic will affect the long run potential growth of the global economy, which of course will also impact on the strength of the recovery in ASEAN. Similarly, uh, uh, this pandemic, if you compare it to the previous uh, crisis in 1997 and 2008, the current crisis has, in our view, adversely affected the productive capacity of the real sector of ASEAN. And I think this is very much uh, evident in terms of how this current pandemic has uh, disrupted trade and investment in the region as well as the scaring effects on manufacturing and services sectors in the region. And in my view, uh, this has definitely some important implications on how the economic shocks from this pandemic are expected to be bigger and uh, maybe deeper and perhaps although more lasting. And as a result of that, uh, my sense here is that that makes also the recovery from this pandemic a little bit also more uncertain because we don't know, as I mentioned earlier, when this pandemic is going to end. Uh, in that case, I think there are two important questions that are relevant in our discussion today. Of course, the first question is how ASEAN can emerge resilient and strong from this pandemic crisis. But more than that, I think the more important question as well is how to sustain the recovery moving forward in the region. Uh, considering that the region is also facing a number of emerging risks, particularly, for example, the long-term impact of the unsustainable fiscal position as a result of aggressive fiscal spending. And also, we all recognize that the region right now is also dealing with a number of concerns, including the trade tensions, the geopolitical risks, even the possible uh, 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 revision or, or, or of the financial conditions that may impact on the strength of the recovery. So all of these hopefully are, are questions that our speakers will be able to discuss during the, the course of our uh, conversation. And for today we have, and we're very lucky to have four distinguished speakers to help us go through these uh, issues on, on post-pandemic recovery in ASEAN. We have uh, Mari Elka Pangestu, which is currently the Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships from the World Bank. Thank you so much, Mari. And we also have uh, Mr. Ahmed Said, currently the Vice President for East Asia, Southeast Asia and the Pacific of Asian Development Bank. Welcome, Ahmed. Then we're also very happy to have uh, Ibu Armida Alice Javana currently the executive secretary of ESCAP, and of course, a very good friend of ASEAN as well. And finally, we have from the private sector, from the World Economic Forum, uh, Mr. Ju Ok Lee, who is currently the head of the regional agenda, Asia Pacific of WAF. <clears throat> so we have uh, a very interesting uh, uh, set of panel here, and I'm sure that would uh, stimulate a lot of discussion later on. So to start off the presentation, <clears throat> I would like to call on uh, Ibu Mari uh, to make her presentation on development strategy on rebuilding a more inclusive and resilient community. Uh, Ibu Mari, the, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you all are. It's good to be in the same uh, virtual room as my old friend, 
uh, Dato Lim Jok Hoi and other friends, uh, such as Aladdin at the ASEAN Secretariat, and of course to be in the same panel uh, with my uh, former colleague Ibu Armida and friends from ADB and WEF. The topic we are discussing is an extremely important one, and we hope that this panel and the discussion that follows can provide input for a comprehensive recovery framework uh, of the ASEAN community that uh, that Jokhoi mentioned, which is hopefully going to be inclusive, sustainable, and resilient for ASEAN uh, at the national level as well as for the ASEAN community. I would like to start by setting the scene uh, regarding the outlook and the impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic for ASEAN. Uh, could you please go to the next slide and then the next slide? Uh, if you look at the outlook, uh, the, the number that uh, Dr. Jokhoi mentioned was 4.9%, but our uh, World Bank uh, global economic projections uh, actually is projecting uh, the, the, you know, the deep global recession that we are going to all face at minus 5.2%. And it can be a higher contraction, uh, close to 8%, if the pandemic lasts longer um, and has, uh, there's a longer period of shutdown. The range for uh, the ASEAN economies is what I have posted here uh, on the table, and it goes from very low positive to contraction and major contraction in the, in the period when we have longer uh, contraction, longer lockdown. So I think, uh, I think the, the story of recovery uh, yeah, and, and rebound, well, there is some uh, uh, expectation that there will be positive rebound. We have to remember that the, the contraction means that you are looking at uh, a lower uh, GDP per capita and getting back to GDP per capita pre-crisis pre -crisis will still take a few years. And so what, what I want to emphasize here is that there's a high level of uncertainty with any projection with a potential longer protective impact from the pandemic, precautionary consumption behavior that's gonna last longer and low investment confidence, which will uh, put us in a very low growth uh, period for longer. And so I just want to put that uh, as a context because this is important for us in understanding what we need to do uh, in now as well as in the recovery. Next slide, please. Uh, besides the economic impact that we all talk about, obviously, we need to uh, be very cognizant of the various impacts that's happening across the world uh, and uh, also in ASEAN. How uh, the, the, the COVID-19 has had an impact uh, dispropor disproportionately on the poor uh, and on the informal sector and the micro and uh, small medium sized en enterprises. Women are more impacted because of the loss of income from the informal and services sector and bear the burden of care in lockdown. Children are not going to school and not going back to school potentially in, even after recovery and after opening up. And this will have short-term and longer-term impact uh, on human capital, not to mention the food insecurity that we're also seeing. So this issue of the lost generation and regression of human capital now and in the recovery needs to be very much paid into attention. Second is the impact, that, the impact on the resilience of the ASEAN economies because of sectors such as tourism, manufacturing, travel, and retail that are really being impacted, and the decline in remittances. Uh, ASEAN uh, economies do uh, also depend on re remittances. For instance, in the Philippines, three quarters of poor households rely on remittances to complement earnings. Third, ASEAN needs to evaluate its competitiveness in light of the potential acceleration of the shift in GVC networks in ASEAN post-COVID. We don't really know uh, what's going to happen post-COVID, but there's a great deal of uncertainty with increased protectionism, reshoring, reducing concentration, and, and how to diversify. Uh, and ASEAN needs to figure out where it sits in that um, context. Fourth, sustainability, whether in the fiscal and macroeconomic sense, as well as not regressing on SDGs and climate action. Uh, could you go to the next slide? Uh, next slide. I would just now like to share with you the, the framework for how uh, the World Bank uh, is looking at recovery, both in the, uh, in the current phase uh, and in the, in the coming uh, recovery phase. So we are talking about protecting lives uh, and containing the pandemic in the health emergency phase as well as protecting livelihoods and human capital by mitigating the shocks. And then the last pillar, pillar is about recovery and rebuilding back better uh, 
which is um, what we would like to talk about today. But what I would like to emphasize here is that you can't talk about recovery without uh, making sure that you get the first two pillars right. And what you do in the first two pillars actually can impact on the recovery. Uh, for instance, uh, if you um, free up uh, people from uh, paying their ut utility bills as part of the mitigation measure, this can have an impact on the utility company. Uh, if you do ask uh, MSF MSMEs not to pay their debt service, that will have an impact on microfinance enterprises and banks. And not paying uh, attention to the destruction of human capital that I outlined uh, just then will lead to reduced productivity in the future and so on. So what you do now uh, makes a lot big difference on uh, the recovery. That's what I really wanted to emphasize. Um, next, uh, this is just a, a, a table to show you that we World Bank has been coming in to help the ASEAN countries with various emergency responses in the health side as well as in the social assistance. And we are now working with, uh, with a number of the countries to also think about the recovery stage. Next, next slide, please. Uh, and ASEAN in, has been implementing a range of social assistance programs to protect lives ranging from cash transfers, cash for work, in-kind food assistance, and other forms of transfer. Uh, and next slide, please. And it is also uh, 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 using a range of measures to support the economy. The main instruments being financing and liquidity provision, tax relief, and subsidies such as wage or utility subsidies. And some have also implemented uh, deregulation measures. Uh, next slide, please. Let me now close with the implications for ASEAN moving ahead and using uh, the, the framework that I just described. As I said earlier, we are not out of the woods yet. So to ensure recovery, we will still need to focus on pillars one and two. Uh, we still need to prioritize smart containment and opening up share experiences between countries. And we've seen how countries opened up and then have had to lock down because an another wave has happened or another cluster has uh, emerged. So uh, these going in and out, we think is still going to continue. And that means that you are not yet in, you know, when are you gonna be in recovery is, is still going to be something you need to figure out. But smart containment will help you uh, prepare for a better recovery. So sharing experiences, how Singapore and Vietnam were successful in tracing and contact, uh, tracing and containment, cluster containment that might uh, be shared between the ASEAN countries. And I think the, we, we have found the importance of communicating the guidelines and enforcing and instill, instilling behavior change to be uh, across the board one of the, um, uh, one of the factors of effective uh, smart containment. Uh, and in the early phase of the pandemic, many, many countries imposed food and uh, medical supply restrictions. Thankfully, that has been reduced. And I know that ASEAN uh, has been uh, uh, successful also not to impose any more uh, rice export restrictions. And let's not repeat the experience in the 2008 food crisis when restrictions did lead to the doubling of rice prices. And I think uh, even starting now and in the pillar two, as we start opening up, Cooperation on travel mobility for people and trade movement, uh, including protocols for health certification, mo mobility for essential goods and people as we recover will also be an important part of national and ASEAN cooperation. In the second pillar, when we talking about mitigating, mitigating and uh, ensuring that we protect lives and livelihoods, uh, social assistance programs, making them more effective. And just to share with you some of the principles of um, you know, we are looking across uh, many countries of what works and what doesn't work. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, accepted that it cannot be targeted, uh, but broad is good in, the, in today's situation because um, the, it's not just the poor that's being hit, the near poor are being, being hit, the informal sector are being hit. So broad uh, is, is, is the way to go, broad, expand, scale up. And now the situation is more that urban areas are more affected than rural. And I think the importance of data and digital ID and the link to payment systems that can be delivered digitally has made for much more effective delivery in, in some of the ASEAN countries, as well as in many other countries that we have seen this uh, work, as such as in India. Uh, and any, any forbearance measures that you introduce in financial or macro policies should be time bound. For instance, the fiscal deficit rule of Indonesia 
of going above um, uh, 3% until 2023. So this, as we expect the stimulus to be uh, needed for the next two years. Using up and scaling up digital technology and innovation, including in the uh, way you want to be inclusive for women, for youth, for the future of work and the work of the future. Uh, and I think uh, in, in providing assistance to firms and uh, as we say, keeping the lights on, uh, this is going to be given fiscal space and trade-offs, the need for criteria of which sectors do we help, essential services, labor intensive firm, uh, firms, the type of firms, large, medium, SME, micro, and informal, and how do we make sure uh, we also take, uh, pay attention to the financial sector because they will be uh, affected um, and they will be already being started to be affected with increased NPLs and so on. How to safeguard consumer and investor confidence and a framework for financial cooperation. You know, ASEAN, ASEAN plus three uh, financial cooperation networks, uh, uh, frameworks, uh, bilateral swap lines, these really need to be strengthened uh, in, in, um, in the pillar two and the pillar three recovery stage. And we really, uh, uh, finally, uh, final slide please. Uh, now uh, on uh, build recovery and rebuilding uh, back better. We all talk about the opportunity for the crisis to rebuild a more sustainable and resilient future by advancing reforms uh, in the investment agenda, including in ASEAN as well as in East Asia. And I think on the health systems, and food systems because of the link. Uh, uh, the, the pandemic has been caused by the link uh, between the, uh, human, the, the interaction between human and animals. And this has been, you know, we experienced this with the bird flu and we had all kinds of uh, cooperation then, but then when uh, the crisis, uh, the bird flu crisis uh, subsided, uh, we, we didn't pay attention anymore to this. We need to come back to that for the one health system where you are really building, uh, prioritizing health and food systems and cooperating on food safety and security issues uh, in, in the ASEAN context as well. And I would say you could expand the ASEAN plus three COVID-19 ASEAN response fund to East Asia. This is a, a, a recommendation. And you could also revive the 2016 agreement to establish ASEAN a coordinating center for animal health and zoonosis. And that can be linked to the um, more resilient health and food systems. Building back human capital for the future. This is really, really cru crucial. In the short term, how do we safeguard children who are not going to school? How do we safeguard women who are more impacted uh, in the crisis? How do we make sure that the learning, the education it, are going to continue uh, and, and uh, kids come back uh, to school? Uh, after the uh, once the opening up starts happening? How do we build back? Build Two minutes back, uh, left build back uh, the skills that are needed for the work of the future. I do think digital is an important component in all this, in the way that we're gonna deliver learning. And the fact that uh, a lot, one of the interesting results of the survey is uh, that firms are, some firms, the good news is that some firms are adjusting by adopting more digital uh, uh, technology. So how can we uh, incentivize companies and firms at all levels uh, to do that? Investing in a low carbon infrastructure and a low carbon uh, development trajectory, uh, having a development and growth and low carbon do, does not have to be a trade off. They can be achieved both. And this is about um, uh, infrastructure uh, in, and building out infrastructure in your stimulus program uh, and making them low carbon uh, infrastructure, energy transition, uh, urban infrastructure and so on. And finally, on the trade investment competitiveness, productivity and technology and innovation, which is going to be the future of our recovery. We really, it's about creating a conducive investment climate and continuing the openness, which has been so important in the development of ASEAN for the last three decades and ASEAN within East Asia. So continued economic integration, whether it's deepening and broadening the ASEAN economic community, and most importantly, the regional comprehensive economic partnership will be very, very important. And it will place you uh, very much in the center of any shifts in, in, in regional or global value chains and will provide an important signal uh, to the world uh, about the, the importance of continued openness and trade in the role and the role of trade in uh, reducing poverty uh, and inclusiveness uh, I think is still a, a key a key pillar uh, for ASEAN. 
Thank you very much and uh, for allowing me to share my thoughts today. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Mari. Uh, very glad to hear your thoughts on this post-pandemic recovery. And I like the fact that you have the, 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 the three frame, filler framework of the World Bank and how you see the speed into the, our recovery efforts. I also like the fact that you mentioned something about the need to maintain financial stability because it seems to me that particular component right now is quite missing in the uh, current discussions in the region on the post-pandemic recovery. And if we know what's going to happen, especially if there is a second wave of infection, I'm very worried about the possibility of a confident impact on the confidence and the financial market. So maybe we can talk about that later on during the Q&A. Now I would like to invite our next speaker, uh, Ahmed Said. We will also talk about uh, another aspect of this uh, post-pandemic recovery, particularly by looking at the importance of macro and sectoral policies. Ahmed, your, the floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lin Dr. Joy, uh, Secretary General of ASEAN, um, Deputy Secretary General uh, Aladin Rulio, uh, Ambassadors, uh, Dr. Mary Pang Gestu, Thank you for that really insightful uh, presentation. Uh, Ibu, Dr. Armida, and fellow participants, uh, we're very grateful uh, to have the opportunity for the ADB uh, to discuss uh, these topics with you. Um, we're particularly grateful to talk about them in the context of regional cooperation. Um, this is a subject that is always important, uh, perhaps never more so than at this time. Um, and it's also one that uh, we at the ADB have had quite a bit of, uh, the privilege of quite a bit of experience uh, working with your countries and, and obviously ASEAN on that. Um, this crisis has reminded all of us that no country, no community is isolated. We're affected by it and must work uh, together with our, our neighbors to address uh, the issues that arise uh, as a consequence, to work together to save lives, to protect the most vulnerable, uh, to revitalize our communities and build back better. Um, and in this uh, context, the initiative launched by ASEAN leaders to prepare a regional comprehensive plan for COVID-19 recovery is really going to be an absolutely critical uh, piece of, uh, of the response. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, as requested, uh, my presentation is going to focus both on macro and on sectoral priorities uh, that we at the ADB think ASEAN should take into account when preparing the new ASEAN plan. I'll also like to briefly share some information on our ongoing work and uh, to discuss areas where we think we might be able to provide additional support to ASEAN. I'll finish by offering a few concluding thoughts and recommendations, and uh, we'll do my best to be respectful of the 15 minute uh, time limit, so please do forgive me if, if we go quickly through some of these slides. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so let's begin with uh, macro priorities, if we could go to the uh, next slide. So, you know, Leo Tolstoy once said that every unhappy family is sad in its own way. And I think so it is to a certain extent with the growth impact of COVID across ASEAN. Every country is affected, not always in the same way, not always through the same channels, um, clearly with a lot of overlap. Uh, but the broad declines in consumption, investment, trade and tourism uh, and the impact on consumer confidence, um, as was just mentioned, uh, these have all played out in different ways across different countries. Um, Two points I think worth emphasizing, one about the past and one about the future. Uh, the point about the past is that ASEAN entered this crisis with strong balance sheets, strong economic fundamentals, a, a, a lengthy trajectory of responsible uh, approach uh, to, to uh, protecting the government's uh, balance sheet um, and fiscal position. And this has certainly helped governments offset some of the impact. Uh, the second point about the future, I would just reiterate what was said by Dr. Mary Pangescu, which is that uh, this is a remarkably difficult crisis to forecast. And so it is very, very hard. Uh, we can be precise, but we, we cannot be necessarily accurate about what the future looks like. And so everything we do and in, in, in every projection we made, we need, we need to acknowledge and incorporate a great deal of humility about uh, how the future trajectory of events may take us. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the first topic, uh, macro priorities, uh, there's three key priorities that we'd like to highlight today. Um, first, understanding the interconnections between different parts of the economy and making the right decisions on opening up. Second, uh, continuing to promote regional cooperation and integration. 
And third, ensuring that economic recovery is green and that it's sustainable. Uh, next slide, please. So one thing that I think has, all, has struck all of us about this crisis is just how deeply interdisciplinary it has been, how it has stretched organizations and individuals uh, to integrate what have traditionally been relatively isolated and disparate areas of academic and policy insight. Uh, just to take one absolutely critical example, uh, very few organizations were able to integrate epidemiological and economic forecasting models. Indeed, this is something where, you know, many, many months into this crisis, we still need to, to make additional progress. And no set of choices is going to be more consequential and perhaps none harder than determining how and when to open up the economies of the region and to understand how different parts of the economies will be affected by this crisis. It is worth, I think, in this context, noting what has, has gone relatively well. Countries have done well in estimating uh, their short-term revenue and expenditure patterns. Uh, there's been strong fiscal monetary coordination one topic that will deserve further scrutiny is the extent to which there can be monetary absorption uh, of the fiscal deficit. Uh, it's also very clear, uh, as was mentioned in the prior uh, presentation, uh, that the health and welfare of the population are absolutely paramount. And governments have done the right thing in, in expanding social safety nets, uh, but that work is almost certainly not done. Um, another key lesson uh, is about the timing uh, of recovery. Uh, and of balancing between uh, livelihoods um, and, and lives. Uh, one Nobel Prize winning economist said early on, and I think he was absolutely right, uh, that the idea that we have to strike a balance between livelihoods and, life, and lives is in many ways a false choice. There really will not be a recovery until the disease is defeated. So it's first lives and then to a certain extent livelihoods. I think it's taken time uh, for that idea to sink in. And until recently, many of us were talking about bouncing back strategies. And while we do need to think ahead and we do need to think about bouncing back, uh, there is also this increasing realization setting in that we may not even have reached uh, the peak of this crisis or its midpoint. Uh, one other thing that I think uh, is going to be critical as we work through this is uh, economies will clearly not be functioning fully. And in this environment, there is going to need to be much greater analysis uh, of the timing of our repair, recovery and reform options. Uh, and, you know, one point that was made by the Secretary General was just uh, the destruction of the creative capacity of the industrial and, and manufacturing and economic sectors. How do we preserve these, um, you know, designing bankruptcy systems, not necessarily simply for liquidation, but for, for, for the preservation of productive capacity? Uh, another lesson is on data. Um, even advanced countries are realizing that they're not using all of the information available to them well. Um, and this is an important set of issues we'll need to think about. Next slide, please. Um, second set of macro priorities we'd like to emphasize is on regional cooperation and integration. ASEAN has been and will continue to be an absolutely critical forum uh, for engaging what will be a rapidly evolving, a dynamic global trade environment um, and will be a critical uh, advocate for ensuring the ongoing free movement of goods, capital, and people. Clearly, this will be an important part of any ASEAN recovery uh, plan. Um, ASEAN has a track record of success on which to build. Uh, there have been a number of sub-regional programs, including Bimpiaga, IMTGT, GMS, all very familiar to those on this call, um, and, and programs where we at the ADB have also had the privilege to be involved. Uh, some of the key priorities on regional cooperation going forward will include, in the short term, uh, food security and health security. Now, this is an area where ASEAN leaders have already been active. Um, in imposing export restriction, in, in managing um, restrictions on, on, uh, on food and, and health mobility. Logistics is another area, ensuring that common standards uh, are adopted and that we continue to make progress in removing and addressing administrative burdens for trade. And I'd also like to mention briefly, without going into additional detail here, uh, the potential use of digital platforms to expedite trade and the importance of continuing to harmonize investment regimes and promoting intra-ASEAN tourism. Uh, next slide, please. Third, any post-recovery, post-pandemic recovery must be green and it must be sustainable. This crisis is a reminder to all of us that the problems that are foretold do often come to pass. ASEAN has already begun its green journey and we must all work together to continue and sustain these efforts. Uh, this is something I'll come to a bit later uh, in this presentation as well. Uh, next slide, please. 
So let me now turn uh, to the second, second topic that we were asked to speak about, uh, sector priorities. And uh, we'll be highlighting uh, five. Uh, the first is health, social protection, and education. Uh, the second is food security. Uh, the third is high quality sustainable infrastructure. Uh, the fourth is strengthening governance and finance. And the fifth is promoting digital technologies. If we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, key priorities in, in the health sector include scaling up, testing, treatment, treatment, and tracing, as well as ensuring the capacity to treat all patients, not just COVID-19 patients. We must also build capacity to deal with surges. Uh, and there is, I think, a global recognition now uh, that pandemic preparedness and prevention are public goods. Um, related public goods uh, that are also extremely relevant uh, these days uh, are things such as vaccines, regulations, medicines, and this is going to require, addressing these will require all stakeholders, private sector, NGOs, foundations, development partners to work together. Up until now, regional cooperation in this space has been limited, but this will certainly change um, as a consequence of the experience of this crisis. One area in particular that will be enormously important um, is the need to find ways uh, to expand vaccine production and distribution and to think proactively about the incredibly difficult choices that governments will need to make in distributing a scarce resource of immense value when the vaccine begins to be available. Um, in social protection, it'll be important to ensure uh, that the poorest and the most vulnerable continue to have the support they need in the short term, as well as in the medium term, to meet the basic necessities of life. Um, a tremendous amount of work has been done already and continues to be done on ensuring uh, that the reach of such programs is as broad as it could be. Certainly the expansion of national ID systems uh, where they don't already exist uh, in a comprehensive fashion will be an important part uh, of this effort. We also will have no choice but to transition to the new normal in, in education. Uh, already across ASEAN, learning has been disrupted for more than 257 million students, including two in my own home. And we have no choice but to turn this crisis into a an opportunity to innovate and to build resilience in education and training systems and to build back our educational systems better. Next slide, please. It's also important to keep uh, agro food systems functioning and undisrupted in the next months and years to prevent the health crisis from turning into a hunger crisis. Uh, to help mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on the food supply chain and to help build a diverse, competitive, safe and sustainable agricultural and natural resources sector for the economic recovery. ASEAN countries need to transition their agriculture from one heavily reliant on a few traditional crops to a well-diversified and commercialized one. To accomplish this, countries will need to promote policy reforms, infrastructure and technology investment in agri-food systems, and will need to continue to invest in regional cooperation and integration for agricultural technology development and trade facilitation, as well as for food emergency assistance. Next slide, please. Infrastructure, of course, has, has long been a uh, broadly recognized priority um, and a tremendous amount of uh, effort has gone uh, into the infrastructure space across ASEAN. Going forward, uh, two things will remain quite critical. Um, one thing that we have seen and we have learned from prior financial crises, both the global financial crisis in 2008 and the Asian financial crisis in 1997, uh, is that there can be a sharp drop off in the quantity of infrastructure uh, investment post crisis. Countries that will uh, need to engage in significant fiscal stimulus will naturally at some point pivot uh, to repairing their balance sheets um, and their financial positions. And there's a real risk at that moment uh, that uh, the amount of investment in the aggregate amount of investment in infrastructure will, will drop. And, and we know that that creates long-term economic costs. Uh, the second thing we will have to do is to ensure that uh, the quality of our infrastructure uh, is of a very high level, that it is sustainable. Um, and that, for example, principles such as the G20, G20 quality infrastructure principles are adopted. ASEAN countries need to invest adequately in ensuring the sustainability. minutes left. Thank you. In that case, I will just go quite quickly. Um, let's just go uh, to the, the next slide very quickly. Um, you know, one example of uh, something that ADB has done uh, in this space, which I just want to highlight, is ASEAN's Green Catalytic Facility, um, which is a facility that combines co-financing and technical assistance with other development partners uh, 
uh, an ADB zone resources to originate structure and bridge the viability gap for green infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another key priority as we move forward will continue to be to strengthen governance systems. Um, this is an area that has been much discussed uh, in governance and in public management. The objective is going to be and should be to return to the path of fiscal sustainability. Uh, one thing we know is this crisis has been highly regressive, affecting daily wage earners in the informal sector, the poor and the vulnerable. Um, these areas will continue to be and should be priority uh, areas in preparation of the COVID-19 recovery plan. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let me just briefly mention digital technology, which has been talked about as well. Uh, this COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the adoption of digital technologies. Um, we will have to do a great deal more to ensure that Southeast Asia's citizens have the digital tools and connectivity they will need in order to thrive in this new world. And we must urgently intensify efforts to bridge the digital gap. Um, we believe this should be a key element of the new ASEAN COVID-19 recovery plan. Uh, next slide, please. Um, ADB, as you know, has been involved in a number of areas. Uh, very briefly, uh, we have been involved in financing with over $11 billion uh, just over the last several months, uh, committed to and dispersed uh, to countries across the region. Uh, through Fora like this and in partnership with others, including the World Bank, we've been generating and sharing knowledge on how to develop and implement policies. And finally, we continue to be very committed uh, to sub-regional cooperation initiatives. Um, if we could just uh, go through these slides and go to the concluding slide, uh, slide 20, that would be great. Thank you so much. Um, let me just conclude with a few broader recommendations on key elements to consider uh, when preparing the ASEAN COVID-19 recovery plan. And I would note that we don't refer to this as the post-COVID plan uh, because these are actions we'll need to start to take even before uh, we are in the post-COVID crisis, crisis period. First, um, as we've discussed, it's absolutely critical to balance um, really important um, and unfortunately it's sometimes competing priorities, health, economic, and social. Second, uh, the plan uh, will need to have short-term elements to manage uh, a smaller economy with the least possible negative impacts. Um, but it will also have to include medium-term elements that will generate growth. Um, this will not be a simple uh, exercise. Uh, third, uh, the governments should lead in preparing and implementing the plan, but we will need to leverage every resource at our disposal with the private sector being an immensely important one um, and creating forums to provide effective collaboration, um, effective idea generation, innovation, um, and financial resources will be absolutely, absolutely critical. Fourth, uh, it will be very important to work, not just at a national level, but at a local level. 